ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time again for the weekly Flicker Picker You. So turn down those lights and pass the popcorn as we celebrate the life and many loves of the Sonic Cinema Experience. And now, here he is, the Wikipedia of Wonders, the Prince of Panavision, the Sultan of the Silver Screen, the one, the only, Dr. Albatron. Well, hello there, and welcome. I am Dr. Albatross, and this is the weekly Flicker Pickaloon podcast episode one. This is it, the start, the origin story. The in the beginning part of this program designed to talk about the many loves of the Sonic Cinema experience. Nothing comes before this. Well, except for three critically panned prequels that we won't even make for another ten years. So nothing to worry about there. I just want to say that when those prequels do come out and you do hear them, well, let's just say, me so so sorry. All right, on to the program. My guest today is the founder of the Sonic Cinema Experience. Please welcome Mr. Ed. Dunderwood. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it is great to finally be on the weekly Flickr Picayune. Man, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Oh, wonderful. I had a lot of people excited when I told them our first guest was the Ed Dunderwood. Well, that's very nice. And, uh, you know, not to be so picky, but just to be clear before we really start talking, my name is Ed Underwood. Oh, well, of course it is. Who doesn't know Ed Dunderwood? Magician, author, producer, rock and roller, creator of the Sonic Cinema Experience. Yeah, okay, so so right there, what you said, Ed Underwood? Ed Dunderwood. (laughs) Yeah. See, do you hear the difference? Because cause it sounds to me like you're saying it differently to me. It, is it? I mean, okay. Uh, okay, okay. So here's a question I've always wanted to ask you. Your name. Say your name. I am Dr. Albatross. See? Right there. You, you did it to your own name. It's actually Dr. Albert Ross. <laughs> yes, Dr. Albert Ross. You've known me for years. <sighs> yeah. You see, and it sounds to me like you're what you're actually saying there when you pronounce your name. It sounds like you're saying Albatross. Uh, hello. Yes. Oh. Oh, an excellent question. Thanks for calling. All right. Well, I think it's time to move on with the show. A caller just asked, how did you come up with the concept of the Sonic Cinema Experience? And I would like to thank Mr. Ralph Morgan for calling in the question. (sighs) Okay. We'll talk about that. I'm glad you asked. It is a really good question, and I, I love the chance to explain this to people because the show is so near and dear to our hearts. And even in the intro of the the podcast, you know, the announcer says this is about the 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 work and many loves of the Sonic Cinema Experience because the Sonic Cinema Experience is a live show made of things that we love. And we love doing them, and we love uh, discovering new things and putting to them together in different ways, and and we love talking about them, and that's where we're excited uh, to be on the weekly Flicker Picayune uh, cast with you, Doctor. Well, we couldn't be happier to have you here. Now, tell me a bit more about your program. So it can be a little complicated. and just want to remind everybody that you can learn a whole lot about the Sonic Cinema Show at our website, which is halcyon-wonders.com. Yep, all those words chosen very much on purpose. Halcyon-wonders.com or backward com.wonders-halcyon. Okay, so go check that out. We have a Facebook page too. 
There's a Facebook page actually for Halcyon Wonders Entertainment. There's also one just for the Sonic Cinema. And as I understand, there is a brand new page that is picking up a lot of viewers lately, and that belongs to, yeah, our good friend the doctor. Isn't that right? Well, I wasn't going to self-promote, but since you bring it up, yes, I do have my own Facebook page. It is so exciting. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, to be honest, uh, just to kind of tell the story in the simplest terms, uh, the Sonic Cinema Experience is a show that was a completely natural evolution for uh, my wife Karen and I and our friend Kenton Nepper that we're working with on the show right now. Uh, It is a live show that blends live music, silent movie clips, and performance magic. And the topic of the show live, the interactive part that we kind of flesh out that's beyond me just telling you those things as, as random facts, is that we're, we're drawing attention to the connection between those art forms and the magic that's in the world all around you every day. And it's our premise that the arts, performance art, cinematic arts, musical arts, have all been trying to draw your attention to the same magical symbols and archetypes your entire life. And we kind of came to a real epiphany of realizing how closely related these things were. And uh, so, and, and we'll talk more about that. We could spend a long time talking about each of these things, and I trust that we will. But just to kind of tell the story, uh, it came about, like I said, very naturally. You know, I, I remember listening to an interview with Woody Allen, and Woody Allen said, ultimately, when you are a bit older, as a filmmaker, you return to making the films that you enjoyed when you were a kid. I wonder what movies. Woody Allen would want to remake. (laughs) And by that, he didn't mean like remakes of films that he had seen when he was younger. What he meant was the style of filmmaking, the tone of the films, the the look, the feel, that kind of thing translates over into uh, what you still at your core were impressed by, embraced and love. And so, you know, Woody made things like, you know, radio days and things like that, that uh, you can see him pulling on the imagery and the tone of, uh, of films that came from that era uh, that really got him interested in comedy and got him interested in filmmaking. Well, the same thing is true for us and the Sonic Cinema Show. I've spent a lifetime uh, loving music all kinds of music uh, I've I've played uh, well it's and it says in my my bio on Sonic that I I I'm, I'm a guitarist a bass player a rock and roller and I play a mean triangle Oh really the world could use more triangle right now <laughs> So I I kind of multi-instrumentalist there yes and instrumental music is what I grew up loving the most my my sister was a dance instructor so from the time I was very little she was playing the records where nobody was singing and I just remember you know digging that music so much you know there were orchestral things and things that sounded like they came from other parts of the world with big string sections and then there was some down and and uh, funky jazz going on and then there was some you know, the, the piano guy that plays with the tap dancers. I don't know if you've ever heard those records, but they're, they're kind of syncopated and it's designed so that the tap dancers are doing all the grace notes between the piano notes. It's a fascinating way uh, to experience uh, different types of music. So I, I grew up in that environment and immediately just really loved all kinds of instrumental music. And I loved all the pop songs, too, and the singers and all that. That's great. But at the core, I just had a fascination with uh, with instrumental music. And and when I was older, you know, when I'm a kid, I'm, I'm still buying records that that have a, a an emphasis on instrumentals. You know, I, I remember being real excited every time an Alan Parsons project uh, album came out, because you know he always put one or more instrumentals on those albums. And at that point, I was thinking, how would these instrumentals work in my magic show? 
So I was taking the instrumental music and blending it with my performance magic, you know? Did these songs inspire some magic? I would play them over and over again. It's like, yeah, you're going to you know, wave the silk handkerchief at this part. Yeah, and then you make a big pose over here. And that's when the ball starts to float, you know? And I would hear the visuals of the magic in the music, and and so I, I just have always loved all kinds of, of uh, music and seen it directly connected to performance art through my sister and her dance troops to when I was putting together magic shows. This is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And uh, so that's that's all part of it. Also, the show encompasses silent movie clips. And it's another thing that I just... I grew up with that I dearly love. I, I remember being a kid and discovering my dad's eight millimeter movie projector. And he had films, you know, everybody had home movies back then. And home movies back then had a very special, uh, very uh, kinetic feel to it. You know, you had to put the reel on the spindle and lock the spindle down so it would stay in place and pull off some leader. And then you had to thread it through the projector and keep that loop uh, wide enough where it wouldn't lock up the film and start to skip and... Once you had it all together, you could turn the projector on and there's that sound of the projector firing up with those sprocket holes and ratchets running that movie through there at 16 or 24 or 32 frames per second. And it, it also, it, it, it had a very distinct smell. That projector had a light bulb in it that was, well, it was pretty expensive. And I, uh, I did burn out a few of those light bulbs in my dad's projector because I ran the projector so much. So that was kind of a deal. But they were very gracious, and they would go get this special light bulb that was like three times the heat of the surface of the sun and and put it in this machine for me. You know, that, that was my easy-bake oven, right? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I had an easy-bake oven myself. As a matter of fact, the brownies I started making in 1969 are just finishing now. And I would run those movies, and the, the celluloid of the film had a special smell and the feel of that celluloid was, was there was nothing else quite like that and and then you'd hear the sound of the projector and I remember it being a kid and and they would take me to the public library and there were two things I was always going to look at when I was at the public library as a kid can you guess what they were hmm an astrology book and uh, the African edition of National Geographic. That would be my guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing on astrophysics. I wasn't there yet. That was you. No, I get it. Confused. I was always going to check out magic books and movies. They had eight millimeter prints of old movies, silent movies. And I would bring these home. You could rent like four or five at a time. And they were in these film cans with a rubber band around them. And again, he had the feel of the film can and that celluloid. And it had that special smell. And so I would come home and I, I was on running on the living room wall. I was using that projector to run uh, the Keystone Cops. And Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, um, uh, Houdini. And his films that he made, I actually had some of those. I had D.W. Griffith's films. And, and, and so I was running almost everything I could get my hands on and just really coming to an appreciation of what went into that era of filmmaking and the, the symbolism that was in it. There's a language that's in silent films. Indeed, there is a language within silent films. Oh, you, you just said that. So silent films uh, really, you know, right now, uh, silent films are having a bit of a resurgence. Of course they are. I turn down my sound every chance I get. Yeah, they, yeah, they are. They're becoming very popular. You're finding symphonies that are playing concerts with silent movies. You're finding theaters that are having special silent movie nights. And, and uh, they're getting reissued on DVD and collections and things like that. And I'll tell you the reason why. In this world of super mega triple Dolby sound that rattles your seat and all the CGI and super high definition 5 HD looks like you're there, all of that uh, special effects, all of that noise, all of that eye candy, the silent films 
represent a language cinematically that is almost primal. It's intuitive. You watch it and you understand what the character's thinking. You watch it and you understand what the emotion is. You watch it and you understand the absurdity of the humor or the stunt that's just been done. And you're wowed by it because you understand it at a different level. It's not all cerebral. It's not all uh, in, in that way. It doesn't take... 10 pages of dialogue and several computers to make this happen. It's the simplest of things, but it speaks to us on a, on a different level. You just see it and you get it. And in that way, silent movies are just like the art of magic. What a fascinating theory. Can you give me a specific example? Now, when, when you watch a magician and, and he floats the lady You really don't need a lot of explanation, do you, about what's going on here? We don't really need any dialogue. You're watching a miracle. And you understand it on a a different level. You just, you get it. You're like, wow, man, that's impossible. How can they do that? And so you're, you're lost in that moment of wonder. And, and it gives you that little a moment of wonder. And that's a fantastic feeling. Uh, and I think that's why silent movies are having a, a resurgence now, because they speak in that visual, intuitive language, uh, just like magic does. Oh, so movies and magic go together just like Bogey and Bacall. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so, yeah, in the show, you know, we've, we've got the music. I, I play the bass, the guitar, and yes... If you come to the show, you are going to see me play that triangle. That's right. I've also been known to play a mean chicken noodle soup packet. Oh, my. And I'm not going to explain that. You'll just have to see it. But uh, I play those instruments and, uh, and the drum. Uh, we, we really abuse a Bauron drum, which is an Irish instrument. Uh, we use it in a way God never intended. Uh, you'll also just have to see that for yourself. Uh, Karen, my lovely wife, is brilliant on the synthesizer keyboards and she is a terrific vocalist and we have some fun with a couple of songs she does that are accompanied by magic that fit the topic of some of the things we're talking about in the films and of course our legendary friend Kenton Nepper he plays the piano and he has this interpretive, intuitive style. He can play anything at any time and probably will. And uh, so the three of us together uh, have uh, the music we're doing for that. And, and there are moments of sheer improvisation during these things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's usually a, uh, we allow ourselves to have the improvisational boundaries around the songs and the pieces we prepared so that it's always free to re-experience the emotion of what we're interpreting. Our music reflects what's on the screen, and we always want to leave ourselves room to feel that in a fresh way, even though we've we've seen these movies lots of times. We still want it to be fresh, so we we build the songs, we build the arrangements, we leave room in there uh, for us to kind of go off in that emotion, and it it seems to be very effective for the audience, and that's, of course, what we're trying to do is is, uh, resonate emotionally with them between the sounds and the sights. Oh, it sounds fascinating. I could see you slipping into interpretive dance. Yeah, So, and, and these are all things that we'll talk about in future podcasts. I mean, as far as music goes, we're going to play some clips from uh, some live shows. You'll hear some of the music that we've written uh, for these uh, films. Um, we're going to talk about magic. You know, I would be really surprised if at some point we don't actually teach you a magic trick or two and talk about how magic can be part of your life and how you can make that something special that you show and share with someone else. I would be very surprised if we don't do that. <clears throat> okay? Oh, my. I'll have to get my top hat out of mothballs. And as far as the movies go, we will talk about the movies, that golden era of silent films and the stars who came from that. And each of them have some kind of connection, you guessed it, to the art of magic. And we're going to talk about that and point out some of these legendary characters who shaped the modern world you live in. It's quite fascinating, and I, I hope you'll tune in every week and follow along with us. Well, 
Well, I'd like to thank my guest today, the founder of the Sonic Cinema Experience, Mr. Ed Dunderwood. And I'd like to remind everyone that you can find out everything you always wanted to know about Sonic Cinema, but were afraid to ask, at their website, halcyon-wonders.com and on the Sonic Cinema Experience Facebook page. Join us again next time on the weekly Flicker Pickaloon as we begin talking about the movies, magic, and music with our special guest, Kenton Nepper. Hey, you said his name right. <laughs> well, of course I did. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again next time. You've been listening to the Weekly Flicker Picayune, a podcast celebrating the Sonic Cinema Experience. For more information, visit halcyonwonders.com or find the Sonic Cinema Experience on social media. Today's show has been brought to you by the letter A and the dairy food cheese. Thanks for listening, and remember, keep your head up, your heart open, and your magic alive. So long for now.